Thank you so much for this wonderful open discussion. We are absolutely delighted with uh, this new format we have included into the Web with Global Impact Week because it really leaves the flow of this discussion and, uh, and, and creates uh, so much of, uh, of, uh, of uh, energy and uh, hopefully impact. Coming up next is uh, um, a good friend, Jay Carto Cantor. He called me a couple of months ago and asked me to support him with um, our um, um, global platform for events. And uh, we did so, of course, and we created the um, event on the drawout, um, which uh, hopefully was, was very, very helpful and um, created good awareness of what is happening and why is it happening. And now I will let um, Jay Carr to present the next panel and of course the panelists. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Blue Planet is Thirsty, how to save the world's oceans and fresh water. Because it all seem, seems we all have our water epiphany and that's the moment when we realize that water is magical and it's the source of life and that it's priceless, especially when it's gone. And I'm Jay Carl Ganter, Managing Director of Circle of Blue and Vector Center. And over the next few minutes, we're going to take you to the front lines of water, and that's water fresh and salty. And thanks to the Webit community for curating these important conversations during Global Impact Week. You can find us and share your thoughts and questions on social media with hashtag Webit. And we're going to talk about how we're going to solve some wicked problems and shift the world's dangerous course. And we're going to hear from Richard Vivers, CEO at the Ocean Agency. And he's an incredible storyteller and photographer whose stories take us to the front lines through programs like the Netflix original documentary, Chasing Coral. And we have Daniela Fernandez, founder and CEO of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, which has created the largest network of young ocean leaders. And we're going to frame our conversation around three overarching themes. We're going to learn about the magic of water and why do we care? What is that epiphany that motivates our panelists and to take on these massive challenges and inspire us to do the same? And we're going to define the biggest dangers and challenges to our oceans and fresh water. And then what kind of systemic solutions do we need to take now? What are our visions and predictions and what does success look like and of course, what can you do as part of the Webit community? Um, so really to get us started right away, um, I'm gonna to turn to our panelists and we're all explorers of some sense or another on this little blue planet. And so in just a few minutes or so, I want you to share your water and oceans epiphany and what literally inspired you to dive into this work. And is there a moment of magic or peril or inspiration that drives you every day? Because these are really, really big challenges. And so I want to start with Richard uh, at the Ocean Agency. And you've really taken creativity and brought it to life in the oceans. So I want to have just, you know, what makes you tick? What gives us a sense of that transition or that epiphany? What, what was that transition from dry land in the creative community to the blue planet and the blue oceans. Well, thank you. And um, yeah, my journey really started in a, a very, very bad meeting. Um, I'd been working in advertising for about 10 years, and I think we were discussing toilet roll at the time and having a really heated debate. And uh, that was it. I realized this isn't what I should be doing with my life. And instantly I, I decided to quit my job um, and decided to become an underwater photographer. Um, and that set me on this, this whole new career path um, and a really unexpected journey. But it was, I was born with a love for the ocean, um, always loved the ocean, but I, I followed the usual sort of career track, uh, getting into sort of a job and, and working my way up. Uh, but it, it was at this moment where it was such a bad meeting that I had to do what I was passionate about. And that journey then took me on this sort of really sort of journey of discovery finding out that there were all these issues going on underwater that I wasn't even aware of as a diver. And it made me passionate about wanting to fix it. And the longer you spend underwater, the more passionate you become. And for me, you know, just jumping into the water now makes me feel this is the place I should be. 
Um, so it's been really tough during the pandemic, not being in the water so much, but uh, you know, I feel absolutely at my most invigorated when I'm in the water. Wow, that's that's really exciting. I mean, so so the world can change from a bad meeting. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> if if we let it, right? Yes. Um, so you know, and and now you know, that's that's really inspiring, and I think to a lot of people. Um, and Daniela, um, you were nineteen when you founded the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Yes, that is right. Um, but I am going to share with you two epiphanies because um, okay. the first one was actually at the age of twelve. And it relates to our conversation because what opened my eyes to the reality of climate change was watching Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. And that's what the power of film has to just, you know, have a, a, any person just understand their outside world, which is why, which is why I'm such a, such a huge fan of what Richard has done with um, Chasing Coral. It's you're, you're inviting a person into this world that they didn't even know existed. And that's what Al Gore did for me. At the age of 12, I... I learned about this concept of climate change. It opened my eyes to the fact that my generation was entering this new era of, of complete and total destruction of our planet. And so that was the first time where I realized that it would be my responsibility as a kid uh, to go out and figure out what my role was in this fight against climate change. And so I spent my entire educational career, uh, you know, raising capital to get solar panels in my high school, taking all the environmental classes in the world. And that was the beginning of my of my journey. And then when I attended, um, I was a freshman in college at Georgetown University in 19, uh, which is what you were referencing. And I had the chance to attend a meeting at the U.N. And the U.N. meeting was about the state of the ocean. And so I'm entering the UN headquarters as, you know, a freshman, not really knowing what I was doing there, knowing that I didn't belong. I was sitting next to ambassadors and heads of state and these amazing individuals. Um, but I was the only young person in the room hearing about what was going on with our ocean, listening about how the degradation that is happening, you know, the, the fear that every single person in there had. And I think for me, the, the takeaway was the fact that one, we did not have enough young people having being a part of these conversations and we also didn't have enough conversations about solutions every single person that got up on that podium whether it be a head of state or a scientist or an ngo leader kept talking about the problems and how bad things were but i was sitting there at the edge of my seat waiting for the person who go up there and say and this is how we're going to fix this but no one did that for me um so leaving that meeting, I realized what if there is an opportunity to one, engage my generation, activate them on the protection of the ocean, but also focus our efforts around solutions, about around innovation, around building frameworks and blueprints and new companies and new organizations that can actually solve for these problems. So those are my um, two epiphanies growing up. And I, and I think that a lot of people can relate because you don't know what you can do oftentimes, and you don't necessarily know like where your place is um, and just finding uh, the space that you need to have, you know, those epiphanies is really important. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I, I wanna come back because the, the common thread here too is, is of course st storytelling and the power of communications and making it relevant, right? And moving from fear to creativity and, and to solutions. I mean, I agree. I've been to so many, so many different uh, uh, conferences and events um, where we just talk about the problems. And for me, um, I get a, I get a chance to dive in here too. Um, so I come at this. I'm a journalist and investigative reporter. I used to work in television in Chicago, and also a photojournalist. And my first epiphany. I'm a freshwater guy, so I grew up on Lake Michigan. Right. And uh, my first epiphany was on assignment for Rolling Stone in college uh, as a photographer reporting on. Yes, they give me the assignments nobody else wanted uh, reporting on the 10 worst places on the planet. Charming. Right. Um, and so one location was along Lake Michigan, not really far from where I grew up. And I couldn't believe the amount of industrial pollution that was entering our waterways and our drinking water. It was just, it was unconscionable for me. Um, I was photographing the giant steel mills down south of, south of Chicago from a, from a helicopter. And I was just blown away by, um, again, how we are treating, you know, the fresh water, which is, you know, the, the, our lifeblood. Um, and then while working for National Geographic, um, I photographed the U.S. deep caving team and their exploration of the underground water systems, freshwater systems in Florida, 
So it was literally, it was like out of a science fiction movie, uh, literally scuba diving deep into the blue veins of our planet. And I never really thought about groundwater or freshwater the same. Um, when I walk outside, I think of the water under my feet. <laughs> so, um, so that's what makes it really personal to me. Um, and, you know, I'll just set it up to while I'm, while I'm uh, talking about freshwater for a second, we'll come back to oceans. Um, on the freshwater side of this equation, we face some really wicked problems. And this is where I get into the dismal part and we'll come to the solutions, I promise. Um, but, you know, water is the number one risk uh, on the planet, um, fresh and salty, but primarily freshwater is at the core of, of course, human existence and, you know, environmental and food and energy security on land. And nearly a billion people on the planet don't have access to safe drinking water, which, as you can imagine, uh, triggers all sorts of uh, potential for social unrest and disruption. Um, and then coming out of the, the climate conference in Glasgow, uh, just a few weeks ago, it's important to remember that climate really is water. So the oceans and fresh water are all part of the climate system. And so we experience climate change through water, whether it's rising sea levels or through its uh, through additional floods, droughts, and other, other impacts. Um, so a favorite quote is, if climate change is the shark, water is its teeth. So when we talk about climate change adaptation, it means responding to changes in water distribution also in access. And then a couple more points just on the, on the freshwater front. When we're talking about climate change and food supplies in that crucible, of course, is water again, and how we're going to feed our world really relies on our changing water supplies and how we manage them. So about 70% of the water that we consume or use as humans is used to grow our food. And so as the water shifts or becomes salty underground or other, other pressures, that also puts pressure on our food supplies. And then just two more points here is looking at where are the next hotspots in the world. Water is a growing source, as I mentioned, of unrest and conflict. And some of the most poignant moments I've had as a frontline journalist is in the favelas of Sao Paulo and other cities around the world where the muddy alleys literally in some of these favelas are being named after the villages where migrants have left and come to the city because when their small villages are hit by drought or, or floods even, uh, they tend to leave and they move to the larger cities putting additional pressures on the urban systems. Um, but we have massive migration and climate migration which is, really, which is already underway. Um, and then the lastly, too, is there's the prospect of what we in the headline world call day zero uh, in our urban centers, cities like Sao Paulo and Jakarta, where the taps could run dry. We saw in Cape Town a few years ago, we saw in Chennai in the headlines, um, those taps could run dry when reservoirs drop to certain levels. A city like Jakarta also has a double-edged sword where it's sinking because of overdraft of groundwater and then also you have rising sea levels. So pressuring a city that's sinking, you have rising sea levels. So building seawalls to hold, hold the ocean back. So I did promise we're gonna to get to some solutions and what you can do. Um, and so, you know, I think of every day about the people I've met on this journey and, and what we need to do to solve these grand challenges. So let's jump to those biggest challenges and, you know, Richard, when you know when you started this, that journey of identifying the challenges and then what you could do, uh, take me on that journey. But let's just start with what are the one or two biggest challenges you see for you know for our oceans? And this may seem simple to you, but for our audience, I think we need to frame it as you know what are these? What are a couple of these grand challenges? Well, a lot of our work has really focused on coral reefs, and and that was really by accident. You know, when I, I first set up the the charity, the Ocean Agency, um, we were looking for a project, and one of our first projects was to take Google Street View underwater, and that naturally took us to coral reefs and uh, and talking to coral reef scientists and. It was only then that I realized how much uh, of a threat climate change was to coral reefs, pollution was to coral reefs and, and overfishing. Um, and it almost represents the whole ocean. Um, as an ecosystem, coral reefs really is the front line of the, the issue. And 
So what we've been doing for the last you know, 12 years is really focus attention on that, that ecosystem. So with coral reefs, um, they are in the, the, the top of the ocean where 93% of climate ch change heat is being absorbed. And they are the ecosystem that is the most biodiverse and it is also the most vulnerable to, to climate change. So we're seeing massive impacts. And it's also because they are uh, also very vulnerable to pollution and overfishing. Um, it's this sort of perfect storm. So this is the first time we've got a major global uh, ecosystem at threat. You know, we got used to, over time to losing individual species, but we haven't got used to losing a million species at once. And that's really what coral reefs represents. So, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. So just a quick follow up on that. Paint me a picture of what, what this actually looks like when you're, when you're diving. What's a, what's a healthy reef and what's a, one that's under stress look like? And this was something I had to learn. Um, it was initially you can jump into a, a, a reef environment that is under stress and it can look beautiful. Um, it can be sort of fan corals um, you know, in bright purples and, and it can look like a spectacular site or it can be white corals. And, and it's only when you really understand the site, you realize what you're looking at. Um, and you know, what you're finding is the heat waves which is, you know, we, we spent three years chasing a global underwater heat wave with chasing coral. And that's where you saw sort of the, the big impact of climate change on coral reefs. What happens is once the, the conditions get too warm for too long, the, the corals lose their color and you'll see their skeletons under, underneath. So you see this white corals for as far as the eye can see. And it's, it's an unbelievably sort of beautiful yet disturbing sight. And that's sort of this, sort of the reality of, of climate change hitting ecosystems that is out of sight and out of mind underwater that we were trying to reveal. Wow, great. Um, so Daniela, uh, what are some of the, the key, the, the, the big challenges? And, and both of you have multiple perspectives here from the, from the young person's perspective and then also from just generally your experience in working in the oceans. What, what, what do you think are some of those top one or two things that we really need to be worried about? Absolutely. Well, I will talk about one because it's the most pressing uh, for the survival of the ocean and something that's been top of mind for our generation. Um, and that has been the threat of deep sea mining. The reality is that the deep sea, um, and for, for folks that don't know, it's the area uh, below the ocean, below 200 meters, and it's the largest ecosystem of, of earth that makes up over 90% of the marine environment. Uh, it plays such a vital role in regulating our planetary systems, including absorbing and storing quantities of carbon dioxide, emitting air into, into you know, our, our atmosphere. So it's under threat right now because there are companies out there that want to mine the deep sea. So as, you know, as opposed to Richard speaking about us trying to solve against climate change, we're now trying to battle against humans wanting to harm the depths of our ocean. And the reality is that we don't have enough science to understand the depths of the sea. We have seen what mining has done to land-based uh, you know, minerals. And so now we are at a point where we are trying to put on a, a 10 year moratorium um, so that these companies first like understand and explore and, 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 and can get the science behind the deep sea before just giving permits for corporates to go out and mine the depths of the sea. I mean, it's unfathomable to our generation who is looking to conserve and protect what has been damaged in the past because of something that is a little bit out, out, of, out of our control, like climate change, to think that now there are there are people and there are corporations out there trying to disrupt one of the most precious areas of our, of our ocean. Um, and so this isn't something that is mainstream at this moment. And it's something that we're trying to raise more awareness about because it is a deep concern that as these companies are trying to find these, you know, um, these rare earth minerals, they're going to be causing more harm to the ecosystems. They're going to be affecting the entire ecosystem chain of, of the ocean, um, which again, we just don't have enough information to even accept them to you know, start doing this exploratory activity. Um, so I will, I will pause there, but I do think that um, if people out there are interested in protection of the ocean, please do research deep sea mining, understand what's happening and understand how you can play a role in um, bringing awareness to countries to um, prevent this from happening. 
So Richard, I want to take you even a little higher perspective here from a communications guy, right? Um, it sounds like what we're talking about are some just kind of are some key issues, um, some flagship issues in a sense of these challenges. But it also sounds like we have a, a massive communications and, and awareness issue. Um, and we're starting to see that uh, actually converge and we're starting to see a lot more investment in communicating and talking about the oceans and also in, in fixing some of these big issues. We haven't mentioned plastics, uh, another big issue. Um, so let's go even a little a step up or step back just a bit when we talk about this as a communications challenge. Um, and how do we take that on? How do we make these issues real and personal? Uh, maybe you could, Richard, you can tell us a little bit about chasing coral and, and and how you how you did that? You know what's what grabs the heart and what causes people to move? Yeah, well, it's, you know, I've been on a, a big learning curve with this whole process. And initially, I thought, yeah, we weren't that bad at communicating about the oceans. Um, but I've learned along the way that uh, we've got an immense amount of work to do. Um, you know, when we started um, sort of working on coral reefs. It was really about, well, let's make these accessible to people. So let's take Google Street View underwater um, so people can virtually explore them. And we thought that was going to make a sort of huge difference because if people could see these environments, they'd be passionate about them. But you find you need to get people emotionally engaged. Um, we sort of then focused on sort of the impacts that were happening to coral reefs. And we got a lot of media coverage about this. But again, it didn't sort of really affect people emotionally and therefore they didn't really act as a result. So they become aware, but they don't act. And it was really the film and the, you know, the process of sort of learning great storytelling. We um, had an amazing director, Jeff Olowski, who took people on this emo emotional journey with us. Um, and at that point, then people are motivated to act. And I think we need to do a lot better at storytelling, not just about coral reefs, but about the ocean as a whole. And I think, you know, when you take a step back and look at ocean communication, you realize how far sort of off the, you know, how far away from where we need to be we, we are. Um, we've really focused on the doom and gloom. We've got none of the positive stories and you need the positive stories. And when you compare it to, say, space science, um, everyone's enthusiastic about space science. It's, it's, it's exciting. It is great visuals. It's great storytelling. It's about people. It's about technology. We've got exactly the same stories going on underwater in the ocean, which is the source of life on our planet, but we're not telling the, the stories in the same way. And as a result, you've got 100 times the investment in space exploration than you have in ocean exploration. And it's, you know, really, we need to rebrand the ocean to get people excited about the ocean and and really want to sort of understand it and then act. That's really really good point, and, and we can rebrand the planet. We can call it. I've been asked, well, why do we call it Earth? Maybe it should be called Water. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> um, but but and, and, and Danielle, I see you know you're hearing what uh, what Richard's saying about about the storytelling. How do you make these issues, I mean, an issue that's just so far so deep, <laughs> literally underwater, like like uh, uh, seabed mining and some of these other stories, how do you make them relevant to a younger audience? I mean, what, 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 what inspires them? And, and a quick side note, I've talked to kids um, who are, you know, they, they see a dismal future. You know, they are looking, they're desperate for that that vision of not just hope, but give me something to do right now. So how do we, you know, how do we make that real? Um, how do we make these kind of bizarre, you know, deep sea mining is, is kind of bizarre. It's, it's science fiction. It's, it's, out of, it's out of sight. It's dark. Um, how do we make that real? Well, the, the good news is that you don't have to convince this generation that climate change is yeah. real or that things are, are bad. So we're beyond that point, which I think is just a step forward. Now, the question is, how do you engage them? How do you empower them? How do you have them see themselves as change agents in their own right, as opposed to simply being angry at the world and, and feeling as if they're victims to governments or corporations? And so the narrative that we have at Sustainable Ocean Alliance is the fact that you can become an entrepreneur, you can become an ocean leader. We, we give them micro grant funding so they can go out and actually build out their you know, coral reef planting projects or their mangrove planting projects, or they can raise awareness about plastic pollution in their villages. Whatever it is that they 
they find an idea and just the, the support, giving them the resources, the mentorship to bring that idea to life. That's what is so um, game changing here. Because in the past, we have been told, sign a petition and just sit back and hope that, you know, this entity changes instead of instead of giving young people the validation that it is their responsibility and they can take action today and they don't have to wait to become, uh, you know, what I was told when I was starting SOA, it was, you know, go through the corporate ladder, make some money. And when you're in your 60s, then you can become a philanthropist and give it back. <laughs> and my response to that was, it will be too late by the the time I'm 60 to do something about this. So um, it has been around changing the narrative of telling young people the time for you to act is now the time for you to raise your voice and make your own uh, you know, make your own ideas heard is now. Uh, we just, at COP, we actually released um, a global Blue New Deal, which was a compilation of responses from young people all over the world. We were asking young people, what are your top ocean priorities? What are you seeing in your backyards? And so I think it's, again, like just flipping the, flipping the narrative to young people and saying, you have a voice, you have power, you have the ability to act, that then makes them more compelled to care and to share, you know, their own findings with their colleagues and with their families. Um, and that's what, why I'm op optimistic because I see the solutions coming to the table. And now the question is how can we scale them and how can we give young people more of a voice and more power to bring those ideas to life? Yeah, and that's, that's kind of my big question is, is how do we scale them? But, and, and what, were some of the, what were some of the big things, the most poignant things that you shared um, in Glasgow at COP from the, from the uh, younger generation? So speak. Yeah. So, um, as, I mean, obviously, number one was inclusivity. So how can we have governments have, uh, for example, you know, youth committees and how can we have them more engaged with the voices of young people? Because oftentimes, like I found myself at the UN meeting, it's a privilege to be in that room, but there's not necessarily a pathway for you to enter. Um, so that was one of the big takeaways around like inclusivity around these conversations. Um, and then you touch upon like the, the reality of, of, you know, protecting the ocean yeah having more you know marine protected areas um understanding that deep sea bed mining is a threat um so just understanding like what exactly are our young people seeing on the ground in their own in their own communities in their own hometowns um and hearing the voice of the people as opposed to simply hearing the the proposed legislation that's coming from the top and um, i think that was something that was very important uh during cop and then the last thing i'll share is um, the urgency in which people want to see action, as opposed to hearing these, you know, by the year 2030 uh, or by the year 2050 ordeals, we want to see policymakers take responsibility, take accountability, and give us year to year milestones of what exactly they're going to accomplish. Because all of these projections that we're hearing, these policymakers are not even going to be in office <laughs> to assure us that they're going to accomplish that. Um, so I think the stakes are so high for our generation that we want to see the urgency, we want to see the commitment from policymakers um, that resonated a lot with the COP audience this year. Yeah, and and so and and Richard, what you know, how does this how does this kind of play into your perspective? Have you seen? Uh, kind of concrete action that's come out of the out of the film and 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 what have you learned that we need to know to scale that kind of impact well certainly the um the film generated a lot of interest in coral reefs and, and people wanting to get involved and you know we did a, a project um uh stemming from the film called 50 reefs which was about identifying uh, a, a targeting strategy for um, you know, working out which of the reefs we should focus and bolster our efforts to ensure that they survive so that then uh, reefs can bounce back over time. And that's been very effective. Um, there was a report out last week showing sort of how effective that has been about generating funding for specific sites. And this is what's so important is we're making sure that we use the limited resources that we have and, and spend them very wisely. Um, so there are reefs which are a lot less vulnerable to climate change, for example, than other reefs. And um, if you focus your efforts in the right areas, we know we can save enough for them to then bounce back over time. And we're also think seeing things like um, a global fund for coral reefs. Uh, that's been recently uh, launched and you're seeing substantial investment in, in this area. So we, we're starting to see the, the curve where we've gone through the awareness and now we're getting into action. We just need a lot more action. 
So what's that look like a, a year from now when we come to the next COP or the next Oceans Conference or Water Conference? What's, what do you think we will have accomplished in, let's just take the best scenario. Give me, a, give me kind of backcasting where a year from now and we look back and say, oh, these are three of the big things that happened and let's make them real and possible, right? Here, here are three of the big things that happened in 2022 that really shifted the course for our world's oceans. Well, I think one of the big things will be sort of exponential interest in, in, in support for um, okay. uh, ecosystems uh, like coral reefs. You know, we're seeing that happening and we, I, I expect that to grow and grow. You know, when people realize that, you know, an ecosystem like coral reefs is worth 375 billion, um, you can, it, it deserves a lot of money to be spent to save that uh, income to the global economy. So I think we'll see that um, start happening exponentially. We'll also see sort of exponential um, growth in the amount of businesses getting involved. And that's because of the young generation. Um, people are seeing the power of the young generation, not wanting to work for companies that are doing harm. They're actually not even wanting to work for companies that are only sustainable, but um, you know, they're wanting uh, companies to actually make a positive impact rather than just reduce their negative impact. So I think you'll see companies just almost falling over themselves, trying to get involved in a meaningful way. And now we've seen some really interesting uh, impacts on coral reefs when companies bring in their thinking to solve these issues, because it's very, very different from their conservation organizations, which aren't about reducing cost and, and approving efficiency on a continual basis, whereas companies are... You know, that's what they're, they're built around. So you have this different process that has a, an amazing impact when you see it applied to things like coral restoration. And then you know, the, I would say, what was that? The people getting involved and uh, investment in this area. I think those will be the two big ones for me. Okay. Um, and Daniela, looking, looking back a year from now, uh, when we're together here again for the next Webit, um, what will we have accomplished? What, what are the three big things that are really possible to change that course? You know, I, I would say that adding on to what Richard mentioned is, is just making the planet a priority. I mean, I, I see that already happening through every single industry. And, and looking at if you're building a new, a new startup, a new company, how do you make the planet, you know, first first thing you think about and not just thinking about your um your bottom line if you're looking for a job like richard was saying how can you integrate your livelihood into protecting the planet so i i am positive that next year we're going to see a lot of planet first activity even the way that governments are now placing more value into the restoration of our natural systems we have never seen that before they're not trying to tie their gdp to the protection and restoration of, of our natural ecosystems and that's only because of the pressure that that young people are adding that individuals like care are adding that there's there's now the narrative is all about protection either you're in it to support this you know upkeep of us being in this planet or you're against this movement um so i am very optimistic that the movement is shifting and that people are going to start you know changing their lifestyle changing their habits changing their careers looking at their finances um i do believe that there's a big investment um also a cycle going into, you know, climate friendly funds. I'm looking to investing in startups in the climate space. And we're also seeing people questioning their own banks. So something that people don't know is that your bank actually, even if you're living a sustainable lifestyle, they're investing the money that's sitting in your bank account into fossil fuels. So looking at every single aspect of your livelihood and questioning it and understanding how can you take a stand, not simply by what you put out on social media, but how you're living your life. It's more about being a lifestyle activist as opposed to simply being, you know, like vocal activist about what you care about. And so I'm very optimistic that that is going to be the, the shift that we see next year. It's around momentum building. It's around planet first and around a financing uh, going into the, into the space. Well, that's great. So are we ready to seize moments? Um, meaning like, because uh, we call them moments of relevancy or you know, in the journalism world, we, you know, we, we jump in the live truck and go cover the fire, right? 
are we ready when that fire happens or when that flood or drought or, you know, a coral reef incident, whatever, um, are we ready to communicate that and turn that into momentum? It seems like oftentimes we wait 18 months for a white paper process. <laughs> <laughs> are, we, are we picking up the pace? I think we're definitely picking up the pace. We're learning um, at a, an incredible rate and society is changing at an incredible rate. So I do think there is now the appetite for change. Um, it's not as if we're short of the money or the uh, intellect to be able to solve these issues. It's really just, um, it's the catalyst that's needed. And I think when we get these moments, we aren't getting to the point we're now ready to really take advantage of them. And what I'll add to that is we also have role models now. We have examples mm. of what can be different. And just to give you some, um, some context, at Sustainable Ocean Alliance, we support startups. We support ocean technology companies that are building alternatives to bad business models. So if you're looking at plastic, we have companies that are using seaweed to replace plastic as, as a product. We have companies that are using chitin found in shrimp shells to replace styrofoam. Others are looking to um, use wa uh, waves to uh, power energy. So using wave energy as a source of renewables. We have other companies that are mapping out the ocean floor to better understand. So all, and, and you can take a look at our website and you can see the, the array and the spectrum of companies that exist out there. Um, but the reality is that we have the human ingenuity and now we have the examples that others can follow to build something similar, to build something competitive. And we also have now leadership in this space. We have thought leadership, whereas we have over 5,000 young leaders in SOA and the majority of them are women. And they look up to me and say, hey, I've never seen myself in this role because I didn't have a role model to look up to and to think of myself as a, as a young person, you know, as, as a woman being in this situation. So I do think that now the narrative is changing, but also the faces and the examples of what change looks like is evolving to the point where we can have more people feel included and feel like they can be a part of this movement. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that too. I mean, the, the transparency and accountability part, uh, which you're saying that uh, you know, younger generations are demanding, investors are demanding of their companies, financial institutions around environment, social, and governance metrics called ESG. Um, you know, big push for that accountability and transparency. And we're also seeing companies, um, I met with one in, in Glasgow, um, that is, a, you call them a legacy company and you know, old industrial world company. And they are seeing their share prices go down even though their sales are going up. And so their institutional investors are putting pressure on the companies. They now have a massive transformation plan to move from primarily extractives to renewable and regenerative. Um, it's all part of their kind of circular economy net, net positive plan. And um, they're being pressured by the investors. And because they are, they're not a forward facing brand, they're, they're one of these brands that you know, they don't make the computers, they make the aluminum and the chips for the computers, you know. Um, and so they don't really have a brand risk, but they're realizing that they have an upfront risk and a, and a really big role to play. Um, so we just have, gosh, we have just a few minutes left here. Um, we have an incredible audience with the Webit community. So if we were to get down to brass tacks, we have uh, a wildly connected Webit community. If we were to engage this community and the tools and resources, communication skills, activation, um, how, how, what would that look like? If we're speaking to an audience of say 100,000 people online, um, what would we ask them to do today? And then how would we have them in a sense, check in and continually in a sense, course correct so that they know that their actions are having the most impact. They're not just tweeting a, you know, retweeting a message or tweeting, you know, $10 to their, their favorite, you know, social organization. <laughs> well, I, th I think the, the answer to that is, is really, it's about this innovation. It's about coming up with the ideas and posing the challenges that allow people to then come up with the, the, the solutions and, you know, innovation sparks, other ideas, it, you know, innovation sparks innovation. And I think, you know, when you get a community like this um, and you start that dialogue, so you pose the questions that need the solutions and then um, one idea leads to another. I think, you know, the ocean plastics is, is a great example of this where you had Boy and Slat coming up as a 16 year old with a, 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 an idea to clean up the open ocean. 
Now that uh, idea was was flawed in, in many ways because it's almost impossible once the plastic gets out into the open ocean to clean it up. But that then led to other ideas and it even led to that project changing to be at the mouth of rivers where most of the plastic is getting into the ocean. And it's starting to have a real impact and it's sparking other ideas and um, people are really beginning to understand the problems to then find out what are the, the best solutions. So coming up with an idea in the first place it's not so much about whether that's going to solve the issue, it's what is the idea that's going to be sparked from that. So just getting up to speed with the problems and coming up with creative solutions is a huge step forward because you never know where that's going to lead. Yeah, and I would just add to that too, that you know, the cynicism that comes in is like, well, there's no way we can clean up the oceans with a, you know, a few boats out in the middle of the garbage patch. Uh, but like you said, it brought almost, you know, from an advertising or from an awareness perspective, you know, the amount of money to, to actually place that is, is minuscule compared to the actual impact of the storytelling that came out of it. And then the shift and the big ideas that came out of it. Absolutely. In many yeah. ways. Um, so Daniela, for, for our audience, for our, for our, our web community, what do we want them to do? I, I would also say, look at what skill sets you have to contribute and find and find ways to to support existing nonprofits or existing startups um, because there is a big disconnect that, that we see uh, through our work and that people think that they have to have a, a PhD in, in you know marine biology or they have to go to school for ocean science I mean and you know my background was I was an economics and government major, um, you know, Richard was in advertising. So it were great examples of like, you don't necessarily have to study the subject. If you're passionate, if you care, whether you're in finance, whether you are, uh, you know, a teacher, whatever your skill set is, you can contribute and you can tie your livelihood to the ocean. Um, so I would say find opportunities to share your skill set and share um, your own knowledge expertise with entities out there that are in this fight. Um, even if you're not an entrepreneur yourself, you can still give a piece of you to, to, um, to the space. Um, and uh, at SOA, we're actually building out um, a program for people that aren't necessarily entrepreneurs or leaders but that want to give their skill sets. So definitely stay tuned for that um, because we will be providing a, a platform and offerings for people to you know, give that, that talent. But, um, but yeah, I would say just like thinking broadly about your skill set, your passion and ways that you can contribute and, and mentor other companies or mentor uh, young people working in this space um, would be another way to be active about the work we're doing in this space. Yeah, I just wanted to add too, and I think uh, for the for the Webit community also, I mean, this is all about connection and it's all about being cumulative, right? Um, so how can we as a Webit community be better connected, move faster, um, communicate faster, and even test ourselves? Uh, you know, Richard, you brought it up, um, you know, course correcting. So here's, here's an idea. Great. It only got us this far, but we can leapfrog off of that. Let's not let that kind of drift away. Let's build on, on that learning. And I think that's a, a big power of, of these levels of community. Um, so, you know, to, to, to wrap up, just a, a couple things. Um, so looking back from, well, let's go to 2030. Um, what are the two things uh, that we were able to accomplish? And this is, you know, aspirational, but doable. What are the, what are the two key things we were able to accomplish that saved our, that really saved our oceans and our freshwater? I'll chime in on that too. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, a big question. I mean, this is the, the all-important decade, and it is that um, shift in really mentality, I think, towards the, the problem-solving and believing that we can tackle these, these issues at scale, which is fundamental. Then, you know, it's the having the plans in place so that we can see us come out of this curve, you know, for coral reefs, we know we're going to actually lose about 90% of coral reefs. And it's about what we do this decade that will determine whether coral, uh, coral reefs bounce back quickly from that. You know, you look at um, humpback whales, for example, we got them down to about the last 4% and they've bounced back quickly to about 65% of their um, pre-hunting days. So we know ecosystems can bounce back if we do the work over these 10 years. So for me, it will be a heavy investment into coral reef protection um, to ensure that we are saving enough and, and making sure that we are you know, really targeting that action. Um, that would be fundamental. 
then it's a major shift in ocean and kind of awareness about the ocean. I think you absolutely nailed it. The climate is water. Um, you know, we always say it's climate is uh, um, ocean because uh, we have focused more on the salt water than uh, the fresh water, but it's all connected. And people need to make that connection. And if they do, and suddenly water becomes top of the agenda, that's when I think we're gonna find these, these issues being solved at the scale that we need to. Great, and, and Daniela, looking back, you know, are you seeing from 2030, you're seeing a uh, success, you're seeing a constant struggle, are you seeing water top of the agenda? Yes, I definitely seconds. think that the ocean will be top of the agenda. Um, and I'll just say that we will have built the infrastructure for innovation in the ocean space where we will be able to identify, we'll be able to incubate, we will be able to accelerate and fund and scale these solutions that can then you know, get to the core of these problems because that's what we need. We need the adoption and the scaling that most governments are still trying to figure out. But by then, I do see there being um, large amounts of capital in the space. I do see governments being more proactive around finding solutions solutions than just focusing on the problem. Um, and I do also see people uh, transferring like their livelihood into the ocean, which will uh, enable them to just have a, a bigger impact. Great, great. Well, and from my perspective too, looking back, I think what we've done is we've been able to change our policy. Uh, we've been able to change our policy to create those investment incentives so that more money can come in and more action. And we have the structure and the accountability um, that we're all demanding. And so we'd love to hear your water epiphany, whether it's fresh or salty. Um, so share it with a hashtag Webit. And we hope you'll follow the work here because as we've learned, this is the decade or the year uh, that will determine our success. And we know that we can bounce back if we roll up our sleeves and do the work together. So thanks so much, uh, Richard, Daniela. Thanks for joining us. And I'm J. Carl Ganter. Thank you. Thank you.